Hey everyone, welcome back. Okay. Right, so uh, we've been discussing about um, the vine and the branches from chapter 16. The, uh, the other aspect of the local church is that we are called to be the vine and the branches. And we've just read from John chapter 15, verse 1 to 8. And it starts off by saying, I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. Right. Um, so are there are a lot of things that you, you all shared, uh, uh, you know, takeaways from that uh, beautiful passage. Um, and yeah, I think um, it be, it's being uh, fruitful, I think, is one of the most uh, resonating one from that scripture, from the passage of scripture, is being fruitful. Uh, and, and God desires us uh, for us to be fruitful. Right. And uh, one of the synonym word with uh, being fruitful is growth growing right because everything god does uh, is about growth right um you know a, a plant grows a shrub grows to a tree right a seed uh to a plant to a tree we grow right uh physically we grow from uh you know from from the time we are in our mother's womb we are evolving we are growing right um and then from a baby to a toddler to a teenager, uh, right, uh, and an adult. So there is growth that ha that is happening, isn't it? Uh, and most of the time, we always use this. Uh, uh, the only word uh, words that we use from Genesis most of the times when it comes to being fruitful is be fruitful and multiply. That means hey, grow your family kind of things. You know, is what we say, and um, and. And what do we what do we say of family that is uh, be, that is fruitful? Is it you know we say hey I see that your family is growing, isn't it? And so, uh, being fruitful is uh, is is a sign of growth, right? Uh, you are uh, it shows that you are growing, right? Uh, on on, on the, um, so that's what it is. So God desires for us to be fruitful as a church. So to be fruitful is to manifest or express the life of the vine, right? As it says in the notes, to be fruitful it simply means to manifest, to demonstrate, right? It, it's real to show or to express the life of the vine, right? And that can only happen if you are connected with the vine, right? As a branch, we as branches, are you connected with the vine? Uh, who is it? Jesus, right? Are you in, uh, you know, in, 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 in connection with him? We are to manifest who Jesus is and what he does. All of us are to manifest love, joy, peace, long suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self control, as mentioned in Galatians chapter 5, uh, verse 22 23, um, which really are an expression of the life of Christ in us. And so when you say that uh, I am in Christ, uh, I abide in him and he abides in me, um, everything is gauged and measured by the fruits, right? Uh, most of the time, what we, we, we try to discern another person's character, not judge, um, so I'm using the word discern, is by their fruits, isn't it? Uh, and so um, how are they manifesting or are they demonstrating uh, these fruits um, and we see that we can uh, we show we show that we are growing and that we are in him and he is um, in us right because fruitfulness is birthed out of abiding in him right uh, and his word abiding in us Right. We are abiding in him and his word abiding in us. And simply that is a result of intimacy. Right? Um, and we've broken this word down many times before. Intimacy uh, simply means um, into me you see, right? Because I show you, right? Um, and, and and that's it. so being fruitful is a result of being uh, intimate. Um, in our relationship and our walk with Jesus, it all comes down to that, um, right? So the reward of being fruitful is purging or cleansing or purifying. Just check that out. The reward 
of being fruitful is purging. So let's go back to that uh, verse 2 over there. It says in John 15, verse 2, Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. Okay, that means it's going to be it's going to be taken away but every branch that bears fruit he prunes that it may bear more fruit right um, um i know one person who's where uh, who's into full plants and all <laughs> uh is there is there anybody else who's into uh, gardening and uh, uh you know, planting and stuff john is very much into it <laughs> Uh, there'll be like a a mini forest area. So uh, we know what all what pruning does, right? And I've seen my um, my mother-in-law who who loves gardening. Um, it, it's it's a general thing, isn't it? You want the the plant to grow a little better. You keep pruning it. You keep cutting off its edges, its dry leaves, and all of that. So it kind of you know, grows more, it, uh, it grows better and healthier and whatnot, right? And that's what it says, that's what Jesus does, is when we bear fruit, he wants us to get better. And it's like, okay, hey, you can do better. And, you know, you can grow better. You can be more fruitful. And so he prunes us, right? Um, and that's it's so beautiful, isn't it? He That means in, in other language that he cleanses us, he's purifying us, he's sanctifying us. So that become we can become even more fruitful, right? So Second Peter uh, chapter one verse five and eight it says, um, but also for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, to knowledge self control, to self control perseverance, to perseverance godliness, to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness love for if these things are yours and abound okay look at the words if these things are yours that means those are your fruits if those are your fruits and abounding that means it's only growing and increasing uh, you will be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our lord jesus christ right and so uh, faith virtue or character knowledge um, knowledge of who Jesus is and are you growing in it um, self-control perseverance godliness brotherly love brotherly kindness love um, these are the seven areas in which we need to keep on growing to be fruitful right uh, I think can we go through that list one more time right. faith character knowledge self-control perseverance godliness kindness love and these are the seven areas in which we need to keep on growing to be fruitful that means you can't say that i am an absolute expert in you know i have arrived godliness you know brotherly kindness i am an expert and kindness i know everything there is to be about kindness it's those are areas that we are constantly uh, we are called to constantly grow right the minute i think that uh yeah i am absolutely kind and i abs you know I, I i have absolute control over myself and whatnot there is a kind of sense of uh, a lack of humility there let's <laughs> uh, suggest right and so uh, God dealing with us in purging and cleansing us often addresses growth in one or more of these seven areas, right? The way he cleanses us, the way he sanctifies us, the way he prunes us, um, often addresses growth in one of these seven areas, right? Your faith will be tested because uh, he wants you to grow your character, your knowledge, um, all of that. Right, so uh, that's uh, chapter sixteen. The local church is the vine and the branches. We are called to grow in intimacy, and in everything that we do, uh, we are called to live out of our intimate relationship uh, with God. Right. So, practical ways a local church can implement this. Right? As a local church, we need to emphasize and focus on intimacy uh, with Him. Everything must be birthed out of abiding 
in him and he in us, right? Everything must be birthed out of that relationship. Right? Everything that you want to do in ministry, that you are doing in ministry, um, if and I can share this from experience, is if you try to do public ministry, um, whatever that may be, worship ministry, children ministry, youth ministry, pastoral ministry, evangelical ministry, teaching ministry, apostolic ministry, uh, doesn't matter. And if it is not birthed out of, from a place of intimate relationship with Jesus, um, you are just doing stuff and you'll be burnt out um, and whatnot, right? Um, as a local church, we need to check upon the fruitfulness the same way he checks up on us. Right? We should not get busy with activity. The Lord is not measuring our activity. Can someone say an amen? <laughs> the Lord is not measuring our activity, but he is looking for fruit. Right? And fruit uh, is, again, as mentioned, is uh, as a result of being intimate with him, isn't it? And I'm just, again, reminded of that uh, passage uh, from the Gospels, uh, you know, where we go before him and say, Lord, I did this, this, all of this in your name. Uh, don't you remember me? And, and Jesus will simply, uh, very clearly, uh, crystal clearly say, I don't know you. I don't know you. And so... Uh, I don't think that uh, we can we can have enough of such reminders, isn't it? Every every day of our lives, we need to have that rem remind ourselves that uh, that we don't get too busy with activity and then or put that uh, priority over our personal relationship and walk with God, right? Um, as just look at the point again as local church we need to check up on the fruitfulness check up on the fruitfulness of your volunteers uh, your team leaders um, you know uh, and under the under under the fruitfulness all of these virtues that we just mentioned comes through right are they growing in faith are they growing in character are they growing in knowledge are they going in self control uh, you know uh, perseverance etc cetera, etc cetera. so as leaders or uh, it up, again comes down to you, isn't it? And we need to encourage every branch person to be fruitful. As a local church, we need to go through seasons of cleansing and purging so that we can move into greater fruitfulness. Right? Uh, we need to go through seasons. Uh, and, and I think we need to ask God to help us discern the changes in different seasons, right? Uh, for us to identify and discern, okay, in this season, this is what God wants to do in me and the congregation. Uh, we need to be able to identify those seasons, and we need to be sensitive to know which season we are in, because God functions that way. Right? Sometimes God will lead you as pastor uh, to preach, teach, and minister along certain lines to deal with certain areas of pruning and cleansing, and that he desires to bring to the local church. Right? Um, it's like very much like Paul addressing uh, different issues with different churches that he writes that you know he wrote the epistles to right so a church in Ephesus was going through a different season from a church in Corinth and Galatians right um, and so again once again coming it comes down to us as leaders as pastors um, to be sensitive to what God wants to address um, in this uh, season is very important right so those are some of the practical ways uh, a local church can implement uh, what we've discussed about the vine and the branches, right? And some of the challenges that uh, you can be prepared for is uh, learning to abide in Him. Focusing on intimacy is never easy, especially for those who are action oriented, right? Uh, um, you understand you know, the story of Mary and Martha in Luke chapter 10, right? Um, he, Jesus says, She has chosen the right thing, a good thing. Where Mary just sit at his sits at his feet, and um, and um, you know Martha doing what Martha does. Again, you know we we shouldn't misunderstand that passage. Isn't saying that we need Marthas as well in the kingdom of God, right? We need Marthas who will sow, who will work, who will do. Uh, it 
I think that passage is all about understanding a priority. When the king is there, uh, it's just, shh, just stop everything and just you know go to his feet uh, and just receive what he has to say. Uh, you know, and that's the beauty of it in the tabernacle of Moses as well. Is in the outer courts there are priests running about doing all sorts of things like you know performing sacrifices, um, cleaning, washing their hands, making sure that the water is always there in in you know in the bronze laver, that the fire is there on the altar, and you go into the holy place, making sure that there is always bread on the table of showbread, the lamps are always burning, uh, so th there are, so th you're doing things. There's a lot of activity happening in the outer courts and the inner courts. And then you go to the Holy of Holies, it's, it's just you and him. There is no activity, right? Uh, it's just you're before him face to face. Um, and so we need to be mindful of that, right? Um, not get too caught. Um, and again, I'm, um, I'm reminded of this, um, a line that my friend made. I'm, again, sorry if I mentioned this before. Um, he said, uh, with intimacy, God will use you. Without intimacy, you will be using God. Um, and I'll say that again. Right? With intimacy, God will use me. Without intimacy, I will be using God. Right? An example, as a worship leader, uh, you know, this whole week, Monday to Saturday, uh, you know, I've had this walked and, and had developed this intimate relationship with Jesus. And so on a Sunday morning when I lead worship, uh, he's using me to move through me as his vessel, right? Um, it's not me taking any credit for that, but then he just chooses to move and use me. Uh, without intimacy, I will be using God. How? And I can have, I would have lived a life of uh, sin Monday to Saturday, Sunday, go to church, uh, pick up the guitar, start leading worship without any having any intimate relationship with God this whole week, not having read his word, not spent, not having spent time in prayer, etc., and lead worship in the congregation, God will sh still show up. God will still touch people. Why? Not because of me, because he is good. He loves people, and so he will show up to touch people. So what's happened there is that I've used God's goodness, um, you know, and so that's never a pleasant place to be in, isn't it? So uh, everything that we ought, we do ought to do it from a place of intimacy. Uh, the second point challenges there is it is easy for an individual or a local church body to become satisfied with the measure of fruitfulness we already have. Right? Satisfied is something that will kill um your spirit being satisfied with where we are will uh it's a very dangerous dangerous place to be uh in your spiritual walk with god because there is so much of him he is eternity guys like he is eternity there is no end for him we cannot come to a point a place and say i know everything that there is to be known uh, about this god right uh bobby connor uh he says, um, we've become all too familiar with the God we hardly know. So right, don't be satisfied. Keep pressing in for more because there is more. Right? And finally, some may not like the purging, pruning, and cleansing process uh, needed to go to new levels. There will be resistance. And hence, there will be resistance. Right? In some cases, they cease being fruitful. Means they stop growing in faith, they stop growing in character, self control, perseverance, godliness, in kindness, they stop growing and may wish to move away. <laughs> we must be prepared to let go and keep journeying forward. Okay, um, those are all very real challenges um, uh, that you can be ready to expect. All right, um, you guys still good? So that's the story of the local church as the vine and the branches. Okay. Um, and so it, it, this is the final aspect of the local church in chapter 17. It's the local church as the lampstand. Right? The local church as the lampstand, um, the golden lampstand. So 
um, we all know where the golden lampstand was placed in the tabernacle of Moses in the temple of Solomon, right? Uh, everybody is aware of that. Yes, no, maybe. Okay. <laughs> it, the the Hebrew name for the golden lampstand was menorah. Okay, so um, and we know that God tells Moses to build this tabernacle, and it was a shadow or a copy of the tabernacle in heaven. And you and you can read all about it in the book of Hebrews, uh, chapter eight, verse one to five. Right. The only difference, and I'll just say it off right away, uh, if between the tabernacle uh, that is mentioned in in the book of Hebrews and in the tabernacle in Exodus, is that in the book of Hebrews there is no veil uh, between the holy place and the holy of holies. Okay, um, but again, hey, you can read all about it. Uh, we all know the layout of the tabernacle, guys. Uh, you know, the outer courts. Uh, actually, we don't talk about this thing enough. Is the gates of the tabernacle, right? Um, it's as important as every other, uh, you know, aspect of the local uh, of the tabernacle of Moses. The gates were made of four different colors, and all of them symbolize and si is significant of different things. Um, and we read about it in Exodus chapter 25, isn't it? Um, is bring me scarlet uh, blue and all of that. God is so specific, fine linen, white. And so um, gates are important. So I will enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. So you enter the tabernacle through the gate. Right, and so just imagine with me. Uh, or uh, wait, something's happening. Okay, sorry. So the tabernacle was was placed in the middle, right? And there were tribes of Israel all around the tabernacle, like a lot of people. Okay, um, if they wanted to come in, there was only one gate. Okay, they couldn't enter in whichever side they wanted to come in. The tabernacle had one gate. Right? Uh, we'll talk more about it next semester, a little, little bit in detail about the tabernacle. Um, and Jesus is that gate, right? So you come through the gate, there's the outer courts, uh, everything, you know, everything that is happening, and uh, there's the holy of uh, the most holy place. In the holy place, as as soon as you enter the holy place, to your left, uh, to your left, okay, um, will be the golden lampstand. To your right will be the table of showbread. It was also known as the table of the presence, or the bread of the presence was kept, right? So, and then right in front, just before the veil, will be the altar of incense, right, and which represented prayer and worship. We studied about that in a couple of chapters ago. Okay, um, so and, and there are a lot of scriptures mentioned in your notes, guys, and I would encourage you to go through all of that. And uh, so this light in the holy place, right, the lampstand, um, it, it 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 was made up of one single piece. Uh, you know, it was molded with one single piece of gold. It was it's it, it's just it's a beautiful piece. It, 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 and then it would, and it will have seven branches. Again, we've seen all of that, right? So three the side, three the side, one in the middle, right? and that lampstand. The priests were to uh, had to make sure that there was oil always uh, in the lampstand, and that that the lamp was always burning. Okay, uh, that it was always burning, and uh, it looked like the almond, uh, the branches of an almond uh, tree, like almond branches, uh, you know, the budding and the blossom, everything. Um, uh, why almond tree? You know, you can ask that question. It's important to ask those questions because um, the almond tree was a symbol of. Um, it was. It was a tree. Uh, the first tree to to bud and blossom when a new season, a springtime begins. So it was it was a symbol of new beginning. And that if you um, if you re read the uh, book of Jeremiah in the beginning, God says, uh, it's like, okay, Jeremiah, what are you seeing? Uh, I'm I see an almond tree, 
and then God immediately goes on to say, um, they, "Behold, I'm going to do a new thing." So if you don't understand this geographical thing, it's not going to make sense. It's like, okay, Jeremiah, what do you see? Uh, almond tree. So what? You know, it's like okay uh, it's like saying uh, yeah mango tree or, or it's just be another tree but then as soon as you understand that and this is how god communicates he speaks right without speaking right it's not always necessarily verbal right um, it's like and god is like a genius at this as in you know uh, bethlehem uh, is you know it simply means a house of bread right and um, Jesus says, I am the bread of life. And the bread of life being just coming out of, uh, you know, the house of bread. Bethlehem is like a play of words. It's like, you know, all these uh, sneaky things that he does. Only he can do things like this. And he expects us to see all of these things. And um, so, yeah, that's something beautiful. And that's and and that's the one of the reasons why, you know, you see uh, an alm, it, the golden lampstand look uh, like an almond uh, tree is that he's always doing something new and the lampstand the light that shined uh that came out that was the only source of light in the holy place right are you guys still alive no because <laughs> i'm i seem feels like i'm just ramming my knee uh, my way through this is talking and talking so uh yeah i hope you're still with me so in the outer courts there was natural light sunlight okay the daylight the light of the sun the light of the moon right as soon as you step into the holy place the inner courts there was artificial light just uh, the light that was produced by the lampstand and the holy of holies there was divine light glory of god okay um so there was no piece of furniture like a lampstand in the holy of holies nothing it was bright because of god's glory was there divine light right and in the holy place the inner courts uh was the light that was produced by the lampstand and that was enough for the priest to see where the lamp uh, where the table of shoe bread is uh where the altar of incense is so they can you know work their way around inside right so the lamp provided the necessary light um so and the table of show bread um also known as uh the table of the presence uh, represented the word of god right uh in communion with the Lord and the altar of incense represented pray, uh, pray, prayer and worship of God. Uh, you know that. So the lampstand represents illumination, right? That enables receiving words of God, right? There's a sense of revelation, right? That's what a light does, isn't it? You put on the light, it reveals things of what is in the room. Right, so the light that shone over the the word of God is saying there's a revelation of God's word, which enables us to pray and worship. Right, and so for us to worship, we need to have a revelation of worship from the word of God. Right, um, so Isaiah in Isaiah chapter six, he has a revelation. He there's a there's an encounter that he sees the seraphims worshiping him, and that leads to isaiah bowing down and worshiping right so that's what uh, the lampstand does now in our context in the new covenant the church is called to be the lampstand to the world right we are to help uh, bring about this revelation of who this god is it's all about it's there in in scriptures revelation chapter 1 verse 12 13 and 20 it's um john is writing then i turned to see the voice that spoke with me and having turned i saw seven golden lampstands and in the midst of the seven lampstands one like the son of man clothed with the garment down to the feet and girded with about the chest with a golden band verse 20 the mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands the seven stars are the angels of seven churches and the seven lampstands which you saw are the seven churches okay uh, once again uh, it's mentioned in uh, revelation chapter 2 uh, verse 1 and 5 is to the angel of the church of ephesus 
uh, right? These things says he who holds seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. He walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do this first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent right and so the local church the local church is god's lampstand set before him in heaven by right? bringing his light and revelation into the earth right so the local church as a, we as a local church as a lampstand we are to be the light in this world uh, just like how the lampstand illuminates uh, the holy place and helps us see the table of showbread, which represents um, the word of God, and the altar of incense, which represents praise and worship. We are, in, we are to be the light in this world, illuminating um, in hearts and minds so that they can come into a place of understanding or revelation of God's word um, and come to a place of prayer and worship. Right? And... And so uh, we, read, we see that in multiple scriptures. Uh, you know, Jesus says that he is the light of the world in John chapter 8, verse 12, and John chapter 12, verse 46. And, and that same mission is also being entrusted to us. We are called to be the light in the darkness. Right? So once again, um, our light must shine so that people, are, uh, people see our good works and glorify our Father who, who is in heaven right um some of the ways or the practical ways the local church can implement this uh if we come down to page 117 is uh, maintain our first love so that our lampstand is burning strong in his presence we then have the power to influence our world with his light the local church must provide illumination for god's people so that they can be in a place of understanding god's word um, the, again, question comes back to us, or you can ask yourself: um, Are you being that light in where God, wherever God has placed you? Are you helping people see? Are you representing Jesus uh, through you, or are people around you uh, seeing Jesus in you? Right? Do they see Him in you? Uh, because that's our responsibility, isn't it? Um, as an individual and as a collective. Um, you know, uh, are you representing Jesus well? Um, encourage believers to live lives and to do good works that will point people to Lord and expose what is of darkness. Uh, some of the challenges that you can be prepared for is believers engaging in good works uh, more as form of a social service without revealing and pointing people to Jesus Christ. So anybody can do good work, isn't it? Right. That's why we have so many NGOs. Uh, you know, anybody can do good work, uh, and I think we are all capable of doing something good because we are made in the image of God, and God is good. But, but that alone is that enough? If we don't reveal who Jesus is, if we don't do that, it'll just become a form of social service. It's so. Um, Doing good without revealing who Jesus is, or without pointing them to Jesus, it just becomes social service, and that is a challenge. Uh, we then become no different from the unsaved doing good works, um, right? And that's often the question out there, isn't it? Um, what about these people who did so much good for their community? Um, and I think you'll learn more about it in when you're studying the Book of Romans next year. Is, uh, is doing good works enough? Okay. Um, believers forgetting to focus on their first love to be the light in this world. Um, so, and, and that kind of concludes the, the 10 aspects of the local church, guys. Um, everything that we've uh, looked at, you know, from the being the body of Christ to the temple of God to his bright uh, army um, and, and his chosen people. Uh, you know the vine and the branches um, this is uh, God's blueprint and this is what he's talking about and and the next chapter actually is just a summary of everything that we've covered 
So uh, let's just look at it in chapter 18. Um, in page 118, um, there's a big glance at it. And so that is this is God's design. What we've covered so far is um, as the body of Christ, they represented Christ powerfully. So this is talking about the early church, isn't it? Our starting point. Um, as the body of Christ, they represented Christ powerfully in their world as his hands and feet. As the family of God, they shared all things and supported one another. As the pillar of truth, they stood against the pressures of opposing traditions, philosophies, and false religion. As the army of God, they advanced forcefully and overthrew the works of darkness and released people and regions from the demonic dom uh, dom domination. As the bride of Christ, they were deeply in love with their bridegroom to the point that they were willing to die for his cause. And as a house of prayer and worship, they devoted themselves to prayer, powerful prayer, worship, and intercession always. As the temple of God, they saw God's presence and glory manifested. As the people of God, they lived radically different from the world around them. As branches on the true vine, they walked in intimacy and fruitfulness. And finally, as the lampstand set by God, they let their light shine in the midst of the darkness. Right. So, um, again, just want to leave this session uh, with the question to you. Uh, are you as an individual or as a collective of uh, or as a leader of your church um, where are you in this journey right uh, where are you um, so in in the next page page 119 um, at the bottom of it it says uh, these 10 areas give a perfect balance of a upward focus on the lord inward strengthening of the believer and outward reach into the world very right, so beautifully put there is these 10 areas gives a perfect balance of upward focus on the Lord. Like, that's the priority and inward strengthening of the believer and outward reach into the world. Right. So um, I would encourage you to just um, re-meditate on everything that we sh shared about the 10 aspects of the local church in the following week before we continue. Okay. Uh, any thoughts, guys? Any thoughts or questions? All right, then. Uh, yeah. Any questions? Okay. Well, great. thanks, guys. Thanks for joining in. I, I'll see you all uh, next week. All right. Have a blessed weekend. God bless you.